to Screech 2016. We're delighted to have you here. Thank you for spending your time to hear about all the exciting research that's going on at the graduate engineering programs. Um, thank you, first of all, to our participants for spending all the time preparing for today. Uh, we wish you all the best of luck. I also wanted to acknowledge a few people for which this could not happen today. Um, they're coaches who spent hours with them, training them and prepping them and getting them ready to go. Thank you to all of our coaches at RSL, CWVC, um, everyone who participated. I also want to say thank you to our sponsors who have made this possible year after year, and we really appreciate your support. Um, they're all listed up here, but I just wanted to thank Drs. Rafai and Newell and Drs. Mifflin for their continued support of Screech. Um, and lastly, um, I just want to thank the RCEL staff, um, the RCEL grad committee for putting this together and for making this happen so effectively and so smoothly this year. Um, and finally, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, judges, for helping us put this on tonight. We hope you enjoy the show. I'm going to first introduce our MCs of the evening. Uh, we have Ian Kingslinger and Santi Lesbrati to tell you a little bit about all the participants and to make the night even more enjoyable. So come on up, guys. Thank you. Oh, is this? OK. Thank you, Emily. Emily. Is that working? OK, yeah. Thank you, Emily, and thank you to everybody um, who put some work into organizing this event. It's, it's, a, it's a fantastic event for people to, to get an idea of what st uh, students and at RISE are doing and for the students to practice this, this really valuable skill. So we'll get right through it. Do you want to say some words, Sin? Oh, well. I'm, <laughs> I'm Santiago Martinez Legaspi. I'm a um, third year student in chemical and biological engineering. And um, the only reason I'm not doing this competition is because my research is really not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my name is Ian Kinslinger. I'm a third year PhD student in the bioengineering department. And I'm currently serving as the GSA vice president for community engagement. I'm really thrilled to be here uh, and get to MC this event. And I think with that, we're ready to get underway. Here is uh, Screech 2016. Let's do it. Our first speaker is Bo Chong Fan. And uh, what do we know about this speaker, Ian? Well, uh, Bo Chong was born in China. And when we asked what Bo Chong is thinking for future plans after grad school, still thinking about it. However, he, he, it seems like he has a very ambitious plan to replace all of you know, that thing called Wi-Fi and LTE with millimeter wave uh, wireless networks. Well, I hope it works, because you know Wi-Fi is a little sketchy sometimes. <laughs> Especially at rice. <laughs> All right, please welcome Bo Chan Fan with millimeter wave communications. Wi-Fi just can't keep up. self-driving cars, remote health monitors, domestic robots, all these fancy applications rely on wireless communications. However, these things, these services require that Wi-Fi is serving a large number of devices and Wi-Fi just can't keep up with our needs due to its extremely limited bandwidth. This is similar to pushing thousands of cars through a very narrow tunnel. However, if the traffic is going through a 20-lane highway, we can expect a much higher rate. The millimeter wave technology using signals from 30 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz to transmit data uh, broadens the road by providing 100 times bandwidth. This means we can expect of 100 times higher rate. But a wide road is not the only thing we need for a tra fast transmission. Without lanes, signs, and traffic rules, unregulated traffic on highway will only result in collisions and chaos. C 
similarly, we need algorithms to regulate the data flows and to make good use of the bandwidth. I have designed a new algorithm and it can achieve a near optimal use of the bandwidth. So with millimeter wave networks and with managed by my algorithm, a promising future of all fantastic networking services is coming. All right, thank you very much, Bochan. Our next speaker is Pratiksha Dongare. Santi, what do we know about Pratiksha? Pratiksha is from India, and on her free time, she works uh, with GSA and with ISAR, students, Indian students at Rice, and she actually just helped put together a fantastic event this past uh, Sunday. It was beautiful, uh, the, uh, an event celebrating the uh, Diwali festival uh, of, of the Indian people. And she also likes to uh, write poems, which I might ask her a couple pointers, because the ones I've written to uh, some certain ladies just didn't pan out. That's right. Pratiksha also really loves teaching. She hopes to open schools throughout India, and she's very passionate, passionate about advocating for energy efficiency and protecting the environment. Which might be very important uh, in light of recent political events. She also says that her inspiration is a former Indian president and, science and scientist, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. And I just thought interesting that this week I learned that India has both a president and a prime minister, which is kind of confusing. So with that, we want to introduce Pratiksha and her talk about solar-driven nanophotonics-enabled membrane distillations. Seventy percent of the earth is covered with water, yet one third of the population does not have access to clean water. My research uses solar energy to convert abundant seawater resources to usable water. I achieved this by bringing together power of membrane distillation and nanophotonics. In current membrane distillation, you have flow of hot and cold water on two sides of the membrane. This generates vapor pressure difference to pass water vapor through the membrane, resulting in purified water. This process is energy intensive and costly. I have modified this technology by incorporating cheap and abundantly available carbon black nanoparticles on top of the membrane. My system uses water at room temperature. And when exposed to sunlight, these black nanoparticles trap the heat, heating the water. This provides required vapor pressure difference to pass water vapor through the membrane, giving us purified water. My vision is to convert this promising lab scale system to the size of a backpack, allowing people to purify water whenever needed using sunlight. By potentially utilizing abundant seawater resource available to us, we can make clean water available to everyone everywhere. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pratiksha. Our next speaker is Sh Sharun Naribolai. And uh, what do we know about Sharun, Ian? Um, Sharun has been having an interesting situation with his email. It turns out he's receiving an increasingly large number of emails addressed to Ms. Sharon. <laughs> Too bad. Well, Mrs. Sharon, um, pardon, so, excuse me, Sharon, is uh, planning to become an industry, a uh, successful member of the industry, then get his own startup, and eventually climb the Himalayas, or maybe just retire by the Himalayas. He just says Himalayas, so that's good. And Sharon is hoping in his lifetime to connect every person in the world to the internet for education. Let's welcome Sharon in his talk, Enabling Li-Fi to its Fullest Potential.
doctors are nowadays using Wi-Fi to receive real-time critical messages about their patient's health condition. However, hospitals have constant heavy internet traffic as well as large metallic interfering equipment. These can prevent the real-time delivery of critical messages. What we do have though in abundance is light available everywhere. And this light has been shown to be capable of gigabit rate communication. A light bulb's intensity can change at a very fast rate, unnoticeable to the human eye. At the same time, these changes can be picked up by low cost sensors on your smartphones. To provide the best service from the visible light bulb, a two-way communication needs to be always maintained. Unfortunately, the size and battery constraints of your smartphone, they prevent responding back using visible light. I have designed a joint visible light Wi-Fi technology that enables us to offload all the critical messages over to the visible light. Despite the heavy internet traffic, this design enables the smartphones to provide near instant short Wi-Fi responses to maintain the connectivity. With my technology, doctors will be able to save their time, receive critical messages, and also save patient lives. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Sharon. That was great. Our, uh, our next speaker is going to be Mehbooba Thanzith. And um, Santi, I heard that Mehbooba wants to travel the whole world. Is that true? That's what's on her bucket list. I hope she gets to do that. She um, also has some plans for the future, work for a while, and then possibly starting her own company, which sounds like a plan I heard earlier. Do you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> well, see, the, uh, she answered not applicable to um, changing the world, um, maybe, maybe. But, but with a title uh, of her talk as seeing through walls, adsorption enhanced imaging through scattering media, maybe I can ask her to think about, you know, getting to um, being like Superman and being able to see through walls and getting all us to do that, that would be pretty cool. You know, if you, if you were wanting for some inspiration. So let's welcome uh, their speaker, uh, Mefuga. Thank you for that promise. I, I hope it delivers. <laughs> Our next speaker is Shruti po Polali. And what do we know about Shruti, uh, Ian? 
Shruti has quite the musical talent. Not only does Shruti make YouTube videos, but she was also trained in South Indian classical music. Her next target is pursuing Western classical music on the violin. She is very interested in, advan in advancing uh, research and also makes science more accessible to everyone, which I think is a fantastic, um, it's also one of my inspirations. She's been inspired by Kalpana Chavla, the first woman of Indian origin to be in space, and she hopes to improve scientific literacy. Let's welcome Shruti with her talk, Magnetogenetic Neuromodulation. How awesome would it be if you could control a human brain just as easily as you would control a television? with the press of a remote control. Currently, we activate neurons in the brain by opening the skull and inserting electrodes. This is obviously invasive, and this limits mobility in the person. We need techniques that are wireless, fast, and precise. I use magnetic fields to activate neurons because these fields pass through the body safely. In the brain, neurons function because of proteins called ion channels on their surfaces. When open, these channels allow electric current to pass through the neuron, affecting brain function. Instead of inserting large electrodes, I attach tiny magnetic nanoparticles to ion channels in specific brain regions. Upon switching on a magnetic field, these particles tug open the channel and activate neurons of interest. My research has far-reaching applications. One, to better understand how the brain works, and two, treat neurological diseases such as Parkinson's. My technology is a step toward enabling a Parkinson's patient to walk again with just the press of a remote control. Thank you. Thank you so much, fantastic talk. Moving on with the program. Um, I don't think that's right. I mean, yeah, yeah. Yes, there we go. Moving on with the program, we are gonna welcome Mad Madeline, not Madeline, Gomel to the stage. And what do we know about Madeline? Madeline is pretty into cats. She's got not one, <laughs> but two. One of them is named Quinn, and the other one is named Renly, and I've, I've seen, frankly, a lot of Facebook posts about them lately. It's, uh, it's clear that she really loves her cats. Uh, what does Madeline want to do in the future? She is very intent in improving people, people's lives by volunteering and by mentoring uh, younger students uh, in STEM. And her inspiration has been uh, her mom and dad, who are also scientists, and they showed her how to do some crazy science stuff, which is pretty cool. Very cool. Let's welcome Madeline. She'll be giving the talk, Improving the Lifespan of Bioprosthetic Heart Valves with Immune Shielding Coating. In the US, over 40,000 babies are born with a congenital heart defect every year. My cousin was one of these babies, and she was born with a very large hole in her very small heart. Luckily, medicine has progressed to where doctors can save babies like my cousin by implanting bioprosthetic heart valves in place of their defect. The problem with these valves is that they're made from pig tissue. It's foreign, and your body knows it. And as with any foreign material, your body is going to attack this valve. After about 15 years of battling with the immune system, the valve will fail and has to be replaced. This means that a child born with a congenital heart defect can need over six surgeries in their lifetime. But what if we could reduce this to just the initial surgery? Well, that's what I do. I have created a coating for the valve that stops it from failing. My coating acts like a shield for the valve and protects it from the immune system. 
This shield incorporates the patient's own cells. So now what the body is feeling is itself, not pig, but human, not foreign, but same. With my coding, I can guarantee that children born with a congenital heart defect only need one surgery. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Madeline. Our next speaker for Screech 2016 is gonna be Jasper Tan. Jasper's from the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. Santi, how does Jasper think about changing the world? How does, how does he wanna start? I think he wants to start with Michael Jackson because his answer was by starting with the man in the mirror. <laughs> um, but well, I guess that's a good start, maybe emulate some of his dancing. And uh, what has been some inspirations for Jasper? Jasper's very inspired by his advisor. Jasper's advisor reminds him to have fun all the time. That sounds great. Advisors, please do that. <laughs> uh, Jasper's going to be giving the talk, Gesture Recognition with Flat Lensless Cameras. Hello. When I get up in the morning, I'd like my coffee maker to start right away. So I look at it, and I wave like I just did. But nothing happens. My coffee maker cannot even see me. Thankfully, my lab has invented these lensless cameras, which are thin, potentially flexible, and could cost less than $5, perfect for attaching to objects. But just because my coffee maker can now see me with this camera, it does not mean it understands what I'm doing. In my artificial intelligence research, I have designed algorithms for my lensless camera to understand hand gestures. So now it can recognize that this tells the coffee maker to turn on, and another gesture could tell the TV to get louder. My next step is to program these lensless cameras to understand more important scenarios. What if an elderly woman living alone at home, falls, breaks her hip, and cannot get up. The goal is to have these lensless cameras installed on her walls, which can recognize her fall and automatically call her caregiver or an ambulance. And so you see, intelligent lensless cameras have a wide range of applications, from starting your coffee maker to aiding the helpless woman. And so with that, I'll say goodbye. <laughs> now that started my vanilla latte. Thank you, Jasper. <laughs> I, is that, okay, good. I, I hope you recognized it. Our next participant is Alexander Bowie. What do we know about Alexander, Ian? Alexander seems to have a passion for world travel. Not only is he interested in working abroad in the future, but he also has a passion for going to Oktoberfest in Munich. It's on his bucket list. Alex, we hope you make it there. He, he's also of the idea that the world would be a much better place if the Philadelphia Eagles won the Super Bowl. <laughs> hey, the Cubs won this year, so we know that hope is not lost. And his sister has been very uh, inspiring and influential in his life that she is the reason why she des he decided to do engineering. So with that in mind, we'll uh, proceed to his talk titled Atmospheric Aerosols, Interactions Between Humans and Nature. I'd like to start out by going through an exercise with everyone. Let's all just take a deep breath in. Well, what kind of air did you just breathe in? Where did that air come from? What kinds of particles were in that air? Well, the particles that are floating in the air, we call those aerosols. And aerosols, even though we can't see them with our human eye, they have a large effect on our health and our climate. Aerosols can affect climate by either reflecting or absorbing sun's energy. They can affect our health by inhaling them. 
And by going deep into our lungs and our heart, this can actually damage them. It's estimated that three million people per year uh, prematurely die from the effects of aerosols. That's more than the population of Houston. My research focuses on the interaction between gases and aerosols, and I aim to find where aerosols came from and how they got there. Data that I've collected this past summer from two sites has shown us that the shading from trees can actually provide an environment where different aerosol chemistry can occur. In a polluted forest like Houston, this effect can even be more amplified, leading to more aerosol production. With understanding this chemistry, we can reduce aerosol pollution, we can uh, improve health, mitigate climate change. So in the end, my research can hopefully uh, let us breathe all a little bit easier. All right, thanks very much, Alexander. Our next speaker today is going to be Hamid Rahmani. And Hamid was born in Iran. Uh, and Santi, what else do we know about Hamid? Hamid uh, wants to create the bionic man, or as he calls it, uh, the research on biomedical devices that improve the quality of patients. And he is also, um, looking at the man in the mirror because he wants to start changing the world by changing himself. And Hamed is clearly a family man. He says that his mom taught him what he should fight for. That's great stuff. Um, anyway, let's welcome Hamed. His talk is called A Wireless Neural Recording System, Gateway to Human Brain Mapping. A psychic claims to read your mind. Do you really believe in mind reading? Well, I do. Your brain controls your actions, communicating information to the rest of your body by sending signals through neurons. Harnessing and processing these signals leads to interpretation of actions. In my research, I design a two millimeter by two millimeter implantable chip that records and transmits neural activities in human brain. It's a fully wireless system and operates without any battery or electrodes. This work makes it possible to harness a massive amount of data from human brain without any infection risk or mobility concerns. The idea is to power up the system by transmitting electromagnetic waves. I have designed, fabricated, and tested the world's smallest power harvesting platform that can successfully deliver enough power to the implanted system. My next step is to design a broadband wireless transceiver to send out a huge amount of recorded data. It enables neuroscientists to decode brain intentions and consequently treat a lot of disorders such as epilepsy and Parkinson's. We don't have supernatural power of these crystal balls, but with these tiny chips that you can barely see with your naked eyes, we can understand what's going on in people's heads. So eventually, I'm just gonna sit here and you guys are gonna know what I'm saying without even me talking. Great stuff. Uh, our next talk will be from Sushma, Sushma Palmulapati. What, we, what do we know about Sushma, Ian? Well, Sushma is very passionate about the biotechnology industry. Um, Sushma says that she wants to work in the healthcare industry and develop medical technology to help disabled patients regain independence and live better lives. She also likes to draw and sketch, which is something I didn't know. I've known Sushma, Sushma for now three years, so maybe one day I'll ask her to draw a sketch of me, see how that goes. Just make me look handsome. All right, let's welcome Sushma. The title of her talk is Carbon Nanotube Fiber Electrodes, Safe, Stable, and Effective Neural Probes. Nathan Copeland lost the ability to move his hand 
after a terrible car accident. But with the help of electrodes implanted in his brain, he can now move a robotic hand and feel the touch in his fingers. Such electrode-assisted devices can also treat other neurological diseases such as Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and epilepsy. My research improves such devices. Currently, as a part of the treatment, electrodes are implanted in the brain. They are used to monitor and change brain's electrical activity to restore motor and sensory responses. However, traditional electrodes are predominantly made of metals. They are large, stiff, and unstable. Thus, they cause damage to the tissue and lose functionality over a few months. To improve them, I am developing electrodes made of carbon nanotube fibers. These fibers are highly conductive, soft, flexible, and thinner than a human hair. These properties make them more efficient than metals as they can reliably send and receive signals simultaneously and can re remain stable in the body without causing any damage. My research is a step towards safe and effective neural implants to help patients like Nathan regain mobility and sensation. Thank you, Sushma, for such a great talk. Our next, next uh, person up uh, is Pamela Zuniga. She is from Costa Rica, and what else, Ian? Pamela has been trying to make it as a microscope builder since the early days of her life. Her first building materials included ice cream sticks. That's funny, when I tried to take some images on my mic ice cream stick microscope, it just fell apart. I hope hers was better. She is very committed to changing things back in Latin America. She's actually the co-founder of a nonprofit organization in Costa Rica that addresses initiatives in energy and water. That's a fantastic work down in our home area. And uh, we're here to hear her, her talk called Photoactive Mixture for Rural Water Purification. Hello. Five out of ten hospital beds in the world are occupied by persons with waterborne illnesses. For every ten people around the world lacking safe drinking water, eight live in rural areas. Accessible and effective water purifiers are a challenge for human societies. Commercial water purifiers can be too expensive even if they could be uh, built from cheap constituents, that may not be within reach to most of the people. But what if they could do so from a ready package, just like a cake mix? With a cake mix, you only need a few ingredients, like eggs, oil, water, and you can prepare a delicious cake. What if we could just as easily mix and meld basic parts together and construct a home-based water purifier, ideal for rural areas? My research aims to turn this into reality by combining nanotechnology, photocatalysis, and ingenuity, using basic parts and materials available in most of the hardware stores, people from rural areas can build their own home-based water purifiers as easily as using a cake mix. All right, thanks so much, Pamela. Our next speaker is Sharon Fan. 
And um, Sharon is a swimmer and taekwondo artist in the computer science department. And Sharon's inspirational figure is actually joining us here today. And Santi, no, it's, it's not you. Really? We did take class together. And I can say Sharon's fantastic. And I can see how her source of inspiration would be Dr. Jan Hewitt sitting up there, right there in the middle, watching her students doing her proud. She's a fantastic teacher. So with that, we'll let Sharon show you how great of a teacher she is by giving a talk on DNA sequencing for precision medicine. The medicine for a sick alligator may not work for a sick puppy. Likewise, the, medi the medicine for one cancer patient may not work for another cancer patient. Unfortunately, the current medical treatment of cancer is not designed for, it's designed for average patients, but not individuals. Precision medicine, on the other hand, allows the doctors to take into account the um, individual differences, such as DNA, lifestyle, and environment. I study DNA sequences of cancer patients. The goal is to find out what mutation causes the cancer so that the doctors may prescribe the right medicine for the patients. The limitation of the DNA sequencing technology makes the data very limited, such as they have only the short and the accurate reads or long but inaccurate reads. I have designed an algorithm called HISA that successfully hybridized the short and the long segments into near complete and accurate DNA sequences. HISA can now be used in a clinical setting to find out many mutations that other methods cannot detect. With HISA, a cancer patient will never again be treated as average, and a puppy does not have to take the medicine for an alligator. Thank you so much for that talk, Sharon. It was fantastic. Our next speaker is our next speaker is Andrew Chapel. And um, what do we know about Andrew, Ian? Well, Andrew actually has a bit of a history in the hip hop scene. He placed third in the best rapper in Baton Rouge in 2007. It's been a long time since 2007, so we have no idea what he's been working on since then. Um, and Andrew wants to go into academia to continue doing medical and econometric research. He's uh, been very inspired by both his advisor and on a different note, LeBron James. I'm sure it was really hard to pick between those two labs. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we'll um, jump to his talk, which is titled, MAGS, A New Paradigm in Clinical Trials. Clinical trials like those conducted here at MD Anderson look at some new experimental therapy and compare it to the standard treatment. And the way that they do this is they enroll patients and they randomize them between the two treatments and they follow them until some event happens like cancer remission, progression, or even death. And after a certain number of these events happen, the clinician looks at the available data and sees is there enough evidence to stop the trial and declare one treatment better or neither treatment better. The way that these decisions are made are based on careful statistical models, the most common of which assumes that the risk of the event is constant over time. And this is often seen to be false in observed studies, particularly in ones where you have uh, some kind of surgery where the risk of death starts out high and then it levels off. Now, when this assumption is violated, simulations show that these trials often actually pick the inferior treatment or treat way more patients than is necessary. So this is a problem. So I've designed a new clinical trial called MAGS, which assumes that the risk and the way that the risk varies over time are random variables. It uses permutation tests and Bayesian methods to get a better fit to this risk function 
which allows us to make better decisions in clinical trials. And preliminary simulations have shown that this trial makes the correct decision, choosing the better treatment more often, and also treats less patients than the standard designs. Wow. Um, lastly, to wrap up, I just want to say thank you to all of our participants again for such wonderful talks. Let's give them another round of applause. I, I'm always blown away by all of the cool things that people do outside of the lab and all of the passions that they carry with them in their research and outside of it. Um, and today, especially, I was just blown away by how prepared and how amazing these presentations went. Um, there are a few pitch competitions around now, um, which is really exciting, but I think that tonight these guys really knocked it out of the water, so out of the park, I guess. Um, the last thing is judges. You have your judging forms here. Go ahead and fill those out. We'll be collecting them as you leave, so don't leave this room without giving it to one of our team. Team, raise hands. Yes, the best team ever right here. Um, and also, for all of you who are not an official judge, you still have an opportunity to pick your favorite. Um, so on these slips are QR codes. Those QR codes will take you to a Google form where you can fill out the information for your favorite participant. If you didn't get one of these, come see me before you leave. And please vote as soon as possible. We'll be closing that in the next five minutes. Um, so thank you again, everyone, for coming. Judges, sponsors, participants, everyone here today, thank you so much. Or you can get someone to text it to you, the link. Yeah. Thank you very much.